just to give just a little bit of context on what this hearing is going to be about so people that are new to this conversation have something to respond to or, or put their conversation in context. Okay. Excellent. Whatever, Mayor and Council, Board President and Board, thank you for the opportunity to talk about moving ahead, a joint project, a partnership with Lane Transit District in the City of Eugene. I'm Chris Henry, the Transportation Planning Engineer for the City of Eugene and Co-Project Manager for Moving Ahead along with Andrew Martin with Lane Transit District. We've been working on this project together since 2015, and this is a significant milestone in uh, the decision making for our future. The purpose of the Moving Ahead project is to determine what transportation investments are needed on some of our most important streets. Earlier this evening, an open house was held prior to the hearing where the community had another opportunity to learn about Moving Ahead and comment about the potential investment packages. Comments received now and through November 4th will be shared with you, the decision makers. The next steps broadly are to deliberate, take action, and select a package of investments and set priority for sequencing those investments. Action on moving ahead will follow a decision by the Lane Transit District Board of Directors on their Transit Tomorrow project. The upcoming Moving Ahead decisions set the direction for a 10-year program of capital investments that will require future decisions related to funding, design refinement, contracting, and construction. The list of prioritized investments will become a powerful tool for implementing local and regional land use, transportation, and community plans. Thank you as you listen to our community. Thank you so much. And before I begin, I will say we have 32 people uh, signed up, so I'll give you each three minutes, but I'm going to read the rules uh, just for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, those wishing to speak during the public hearing must submit a completed request to speak form to the information desk prior to the beginning of the public hearing. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residents, your ward if known. You will have three minutes to comment. There are lights on the timer. The red light indicates the end of three minutes. And we have a warm-up chair, so I'll call two names at a time, and the first name can come to the podium, and the second name can be right at hand, ready to uh, move, move when their time is up, is available. So thank you all very much. And first up is David Wade, followed by Christopher Logan. Thank you for hearing us out. I'm in Alan Zelinka's ward, wherever that is. Um, my name is David Wade, and I live in the city of Eugene. The, the issue of our time is climate change, and everything you do, you need to ask yourself, how does this affect climate change? If you're not asking that question, you're making a planet-threatening mistake. The only option here that helps slow down climate change is the MX, all MX corridor. Eugenians will not get out of their cars to take a bus. It's too low class, it's too threatening, it doesn't come on time, it doesn't come often enough, and anyway, it's low class, okay? They will get out of their cars to take MX. Why? It's high class, it's high tech, it looks like a trolley, it has fixed stations, it runs every 10 minutes, it doesn't run late unless a bus breaks down, okay? The only way to get people out of their cars in Eugene is to go with the MX corridor. Any other choice is just saying, well, we don't really care about climate change at this point, we'll just buy some right away and do MX later. Big mistake. Later in climate change is a big mistake. Portland made the terrible error of going with fixed rail. Costs 10 times as much as MX. They don't have the money to complete it. Now they have to go with these enhanced bus corridors. No one takes a bus, whether it's enhanced or unenhanced. Okay, I rode the number 11 bus for six years before you put in MX. It ran every 15 minutes, it was an enhanced bus route, and I'm the only coat and tie on that bus for six years. Why? It's low class. People are not gonna get out of their car to take a bus if it runs every 15 minutes or every five. They're not gonna do it. So, if you wanna do something about climate change and you wanna avoid the mistakes Portland has made, MX Corridor, thank you very much. Thank you. Christopher Logan. 
followed by Rob Zako. Hi, I'd like to uh, agree to some extent with the last speaker and disagree to some extent because. Could you tell us where you live? Oh, I'm Christopher Logan and I live on River Road, 1229 Dalton Drive. Um, everything you build, even an MX bus, causes global warming. Steel has to be smelted with coal. There is no other way. Transportation of materials. And you build new roads, you got to have concrete. Where do you get concrete? It's a tremendous emitter of uh, carbon. And they steal gravel from the buttes. They steal it from the Willamette River. And then when they demolish stuff, Willamette sand and gravel sticks the demolition waste back where we used to have gravel that was like historically deposited, right? And now we have concrete and tires and things like that. So every construction causes global warming. And if you want to be carbon neutral, the first thing you got to do is stop this, we have to build. It says here, Eugene is growing. We expect 34,000 new people and 37,000 new jobs. Where did you get the idea you were going to get 37,000 new jobs? Uh, sorry, where do we get the idea we're going to definitely get 37,000 jobs? What you're going to do is you're going to bring a bunch of people from Los Angeles to come up here for the squirrels, and the rest of us have to endure these ugly buildings, these huge uh, MX with the, the turn lanes. And Okay, MX would be good on... Uh, Going to Springfield, it's good on Highway 99. It, you know, you might as well uh, run it up West 11th. That place is already destroyed. But River Road is special. River Road is the garden district of your city. It's where we have large lots. We have kids playing in the lanes. And that's why we move there. We don't need more construction. And here, sorry, it says, Moving Ahead's ultimate goal is to create a 10-year investment plan for five key corridors. The investment plan envisions thousands of new riders only going up and down River Road, but nobody lives on River Road. We all live in the lanes. What we need is connectors, you know? And I'd like to give you another plan. A better plan would be to forgive the fees for building ADUs mother-in-law is in the back of our property. Because if you do that, you'll have your infill right away. We'll build it. You don't have to have these out-of-state uh, developers come and build it. And the neighbors will be integrated with the neighborhood. And we don't have to have these big, ugly buildings. But if you build a corridor down River Road, it has to have riders living along the street. Thank so you. please, no build. Thank you. Rob Zako. Followed by Sarah Mazzi. Mayor, City Councilors, and LTD Board Members, I am Rob Zako, the Executive Director of Better Eugene Springfield Transportation. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. Thank you also to the Moving Ahead team for all their good work getting us to this point. Best suggests that Moving Ahead boils down to two key questions. The first question is fundamental and easy. What does the public want? Our community values the triple bottom line of people, prosperity, and planet. In line with these values, Best finds our community shares a vision for complete streets, offering different ways to go, vision zero so everyone gets here safely, and compact urban development so more people have access to such good transportation options. The visions reflect an adopted plans and policies, including Envision Eugene, the Transportation System Plan, the Vision Zero Action Plan, LTD's Long Range Transit Plan, and the Climate Recovery Ordinance. The second question is technical and hence harder. For each of the five movie headquarters, should the locally preferred alternative be the familiar MX or a newer concept known as enhanced corridor? The choice is akin to a car salesperson offering you a deluxe or basic package. You don't really need or want to pay for everything in the deluxe package, but the basic package isn't enough. Similarly, Best recommends something between MX and enhanced corridor, we're calling enhanced corridor plus. Enhanced Corridor provides more frequent useful transit service by using the right combination of tools for the job. Last year, the City of Portland adopted this new concept with their Enhanced Transit Corridor plan. When it comes to transit, Best recommends Enhanced Corridor is, is the, offers the most of the benefits of MX a fraction of the cost. But investing in Enhanced Corridor is enough. We need at least three additional items. One, safety. 
As protecting life must be our top priority, we must not cut corners when it comes to safety, especially for the most vulnerable people who are walking, bicycling, and using mobility devices. For all corridors, make all the safety improvements planned in the MX alternative. Two, Franklin Boulevard. The MX we have is already successful. Indeed, it's so successful that there's a critical need to add a second MX track or lane to support more frequent service by the University of Oregon. To do just that, prioritize the Franklin Boulevard transportation project. Three, other actions. Lastly, is it enough just to invest in infrastructure, expecting that if we build it, they will come? Strategically leverage major capital investments with other coordinated actions. For example, implement transit tomorrow to provide frequent useful transit service as soon as fall 2020. For example, develop funding for a stable level of transit service through economic boom and bus cycles. For example, change setback requirements to protect needed rights of way for future bus rapid transit. For example, adopt land use changes to support desired transit oriented development in line with Vision Eugene. In conclusion, to advance our community's shared vision for better transportation, select Enhanced Quarter Plus. And you should all have this Enhanced Quarter Plus handout there. If people in the audience would like it, you've got more copies. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Mazzi, followed by Phil Farrington. Mayor, City Council, and LTD Board. My name is Sarah Mazzi. I'm the Safe Roads to School Coordinator for 4J School District. I live in the River Road neighborhood, and I also support Enhanced Plus. And by that, I mean that I would like to see a sufficient incre increase in frequency of transit and a sufficient improvement in safety for people walking and biking that we can actually meet the goals and priorities that Rob just described um, and that have been adopted by City Council around mode shift, reduction in fossil fuel use, and reduction in traffic deaths or elimination of traffic, traffic deaths on the adopted timelines. We are not on track right now for that. And I'll just share with you something that I hear from families. I speak with a lot of families about whether they feel com how, how their children travel to school, what they feel comfortable with. And a lot of people tell me that the roads are too dangerous for their kids to use active transportation and the paths don't feel safe to them because of people living on the paths. And whether that's real or simply perceived risk, it is changing, those things are changing behavior. And indeed, we have actually had four students already that I know of who have been hit um, walking or biking to school in just the month and a half since school has started. Um, meanwhile, behaviors are changing in a positive way where the city and county and 4J have invested in infrastructure improvements um, like Grove Street near Howard and Kelly Elementary in North Park, um, like the active Amazon corridor, we are seeing more students walking, we're seeing more bikes in the bike racks, and these are just small changes. So imagine if we were to actually roll out changes in a way that they've done in other countries like Denmark and the Netherlands, where they end up with a third to half of trip, all trips being made by bike, and then, uh, huge amount of trips made by transit and walking. In Seville, Spain, in one year, they put in something like 35 miles of protected bikeway, and they saw, after a couple of years, their trips by bike increased by 10%. Um, we, the end result is that a transportation system that's more accessible to the young, to the old, to those who can't afford to drive themselves, and then there's less traffic on the roads for those who do need to drive themselves. They've, these other places that have done this, they've had pushback on individual projects just like we have here, but they've kept their eye on the prize and they've pushed forward. And so I ask all of you to please support our staff at LTD and at the, in the city in pressing forward with the safety improvements that we need and the increase in service that we need um, to actually make transit and active transportation the safest and easiest choice because that's how we're going to actually make the changes that we need. And these need to be the obvious way to go rather than grabbing your car keys and getting in the car. So I ask, all right, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Phil Farrington, followed by Laura Potter. Good evening, my name is Phil Farrington. Um, I live in uh, Ward 1. I'm here representing uh, CDC Management Corp, where I serve as the Planning and Real Estate Development Director. Over 20 years ago, I came to Eugene and worked with Councillor Pryor back then for Willamette Lane Park District and served on the Transportation System Improvements Committee uh, for TransPlan, which had conceived of MX. A remarkable uh, vision that 
honestly, at the time, I probably thought would not have been implemented in the manner in which it has uh, at this time. So I think uh, hats off to everybody in the community for making such a successful uh, system that we have and enjoy today and is the uh, kind of the rival of so many other communities. I'm here though speaking on behalf of the owners of property along Coburg Road uh, about the potential to redevelop um, and the implications of MX or um, enhanced transit and the taking of right of way off of uh, existing property. I know that LTD has a great track record of being sensitive to property owners for those takings and trying to minimize those as much as possible. In the enhanced transit uh, model that's proposed at the intersection of Beltline and uh, Coburg Road is proposed a, a dedicated right-hand turn lane that takes um, some square footage, uh, I think the staff has told me about 4,615 square feet from the property that abuts uh, uh, these, uh, uh, this portion of, of Coburg Road. Whereas we're trying to redevelop this property that formerly housed KEZI studio uh, location, we're in this difficult position of trying to one code requirements uh, that, that we must meet to put the building within so uh, only so much proximity of the existing right of way and yet also according enough right of way to accommodate for future MX or, or enhanced transit development. It puts the development uh, and the developer in a very difficult position of trying to determine that we can meet code today and yet accommodate the needs of transit in the future. Um, we know that we'll have an opportunity to work with city and, and LTD staff going forward to try and work on this, but I ask you all to be very sensitive to the implications of an expanding right-of-way to accommodate and its implications and meaning for businesses and redevelopment concepts consistent with your own established goals and codes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Laura Potter, followed by Marianne uh, Nolte. Good evening, my name is Laura Potter. I live in Eugene in Ward 2. I'm a board member of Better Eugene Springfield Transportation and I was a founding member of BEST and I'm excited to be back on the board since moving back to Eugene. I am speaking tonight on behalf of BEST to urge you to pursue an enhanced corridor plus. BEST believes this is the most cost effective alternative for improving the ways all people can get around Eugene. BEST formed in 2012 to support West Eugene MX because we knew then, as we do now, it is critical to invest in our community's future. We need complete streets that enable people with different needs to choose the best way to get around safely, practically, and affordably. Eugene is better off for the transportation options we have. The investments we have made have contributed to increased livability for people in our community. Bess wants to see that tradition of investment continue in a way that maximizes our dollars to serve the most people. I love MX. I think it is a fabulous model for transit and I am proud of the MX lines we have here in Eugene. But completely building out MX will cost $332 million and result in increased operating costs of $8.2 million a year. While the enhanced investment package, which we are recommending, is projected to cost around $145 million and result in an operating cost decrease. And after reviewing the MX alternatives, we still, Best still has outstanding questions and hasn't seen sufficient evidence that the benefits justify the significantly higher costs compared to enhanced corridors. I also must point out that one of the primary motivations for building MX is to provide frequent service along major corridors. LTD is working to achieve this goal through the Transit Tomorrow program, an initiative to take existing revenue and reallocate it to provide more frequency and consistency in service along major corridors. Our vision when we formed BEST was to bring together voices from the different perspectives in the community who interacted with transit and transportation. We knew that transit isn't just a business issue or an environmental issue. It wasn't just about low-income riders or students. Having a good transit network, safe streets, bike lanes, and transportation options is important for the entire community today and in the future. This diversity of perspective is still a core value of BEST, as I think you will see demonstrated here tonight. It's not just what one person or organization thinks. It's about a group of community leaders coming together, understanding each other's perspective and figuring out how to achieve our goals with the resources we have. I hope you will consider our recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Marianne Nolte followed by Phil Barnhart. 
Good evening. My name is Marianne Nolte. I'm with Better Eugene Springfield Transportation. I'm the Transportation Options Coordinator. And I'm speaking tonight in support of Enhanced Corridor Plus. I want to note that over the last five years, the city's ideas about bus rapid transit have evolved. Under TransPlan, which was adopted in 2001, the vision was for 61 miles of bus rapid transit or an MX-like service along major corridors in Eugene and Springfield. Since that time, however, the region's vision has changed. LTD's long-range plan from 2014 and Eugene's transportation system plan from 2017 do not explicitly call for bus rapid transit or MX, but they do call for a frequent transit network. The plans are now more focused on useful service, whatever that useful service's shape might take. LTD is on the verge of achieving the frequent transit network as they launch Transit Tomorrow. Transit Tomorrow calls for frequent service every 15 minutes along most major corridors in Eugene and Springfield, including all five moving ahead corridors. So our aim was to implement a frequent transit network. We are doing that as early as fall 2020, which is one year from now. It may be that Transit Tomorrow gives us the service improvements that we need without the costly infrastructure in investments that bus rapid transit would entail. BEST has analyzed this issue over the last several months, and I have a handout here of our analysis that I'll hand to um, the city manager, and you should have all received an email of this, but this contains our analysis and our recommendations for how to move forward with Enhanced Corridor Plus. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Phil Barnhart, followed by Jolene Simpson. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for holding this meeting. My name is Phil Barnhart. I live in Ward 3. And I'm the president of a new organization called the Emerald Valley Electric Vehicle Association. Uh, because it's just organizing, I do not claim to speak for them, only for myself. I am not an expert on transportation. Uh, I have been reviewing the, uh, this plan, uh, the uh, Transit Tomorrow plan, and some other things as a part of uh, my attendance at the uh, local, uh, the local government affairs committee of the Chamber of Commerce. Which, by the way, if you if you haven't been there, you ought to uh, attend now and then. It's extremely useful meetings. I, I do have a couple of comments, however. Uh, we are faced with a huge climate emergency uh, worldwide. The city of Eugene and uh, uh, Lane Transit District has a part to play in ameliorating and solving uh, for carbon carbon emissions and other aspects of this problem. But in order to do it, you have to look at different systems as if they were part of integrated holes. Uh, the, the, the insight if I, that I bring, if I have one, uh, to this discussion is that the plans are fragmented, uh, they're being considered separately as if they were separate issues, uh, and they're not uh, being integrated in ways that will actually be useful to our community. That, of course, includes Transit Tomorrow, but it also includes the housing, uh, long-term housing plans, uh, which have to be built in such a way that walking is the main source of transportation uh, to uh, shopping and to work uh, rather than uh, transit uh, bicycles or cars. Uh, we need to move rapidly toward a city which has this infrastructure designed uh, for electric vehicles uh, because we don't have time to rebuild the city uh, to move, do all of our movement by, by car, I mean, sorry, by bicycle, uh, walking or by bus. Uh, and that would include things like uh, the additional uh, building code uh, option that you ought to be looking at to make certain that there are enough electric vehicle chargers uh, in new construction. Uh, there's a whole variety of issues which I have not touched on that have to be considered together. Now I know that your, your procedures especially things like uh, applying for federal grants have to be done in what look like silos. But I hope that you are all working to integrate uh, the entire planning systems so that we can actually change our city so that it becomes a city which, in which it's capable to reduce carbon emissions, to increase people's livability, uh, and to make life uh, uh, better for all of us. It's a worldwide problem, but we can do our part. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jolene Simpson, followed by Mike Eister. Good evening, uh, Mayor, City Council, LTD Board. My name is Jolene Simpson. I'm a River Road 
neighbor. Um, I've served on multiple neighborhood planning advisory committees over the last couple of decades. <clears throat> I'm previously the co-chair of the River Road Community Organization. Um, in addition, while working at the University of Oregon for 25 years, I was a year-round cyclist. Um, I commuted by bike and also occasionally a bus rider, and I did use MX and enjoyed it quite a bit. Currently in retirement, I find myself walking daily, mostly with my dog in the neighborhood and along the river pass. I support the MX option for the River Road Santa Clara Transportation Corridor as the best choice for redevelopment of this busy transportation corridor. The MX op option offers 21st century solutions to ongoing concerns regarding the crisis of climate change, increases in our local population, and real concerns regarding all user safety. Numerous public planning processes involving the River Road Santa Clara neighborhoods have targeted issues of multimodal transportation in River Road. Previously, a two-lane thoroughfare, currently a five-lane major arterial supporting close to 20,000 vehicles a day. Increased traffic has created a serious barrier to access across River Ro Road, creating a negative environment for the neighborhood and generating safety concerns for cyclists and pedestrians. Lack of protected crossings across five lanes of traffic makes it difficult for neighbors to access local businesses, bus stops, and nearby parks and open space. Narrow bike lanes and speeding cars create a risky environment for cyclists. Increased auto traffic has led to noise pollution and air pollution. As we look to creative solutions to mitigate the unfolding environmental crisis of climate change, which is largely due to increased carbon emissions, it's imperative that we pursue bold options. The MX option would provide for improved multimodal amenities and a safer corridor for all users, especially cyclists and pedestrians. Creative thinking about using electric vans for neighborhood connectors as neighborhood connectors in the River Road neighborhood has real merit. Supporting the MX option can achieve reduction in vehicle miles traveled as well as improvements for all users. I support the MX option as the best way to create a reimagined transportation corridor that best supports local businesses and housing development, will best serve to calm the burden of increased auto traffic, and importantly has the best plans for supporting bike and pedestrian users. Supporting the MX option for River Road will move our transportation system into the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Eister, followed by Seth Sadowski. Good evening, Council and Board. Uh, my name is Mike Eister, I live in Springfield. I want to start by commending LTD uh, for the fine work that they've done. Um, we're a pioneer of MX, We uh, the new MGO system, uh, the new fare system that's in place. Transit tomorrow moving ahead, we're, we're on the cutting edge of a number of things and I'm, I'm proud to be in, in a community that is, uh, is on that cutting edge and, and good work to you, LTD. I'm here tonight to um, say that I had chaired the board uh, of LTD for five years, served on the board for eight years. I'm an advocate of LTD and MX. At the same time, I'm aware that it's important to use the right tool for the right job. And I don't think that MX is the right tool for every job. I think it is uh, a good tool for many jobs. Uh, but I, I think that uh, the enhanced plus corridor is probably the right direction to go for the, uh, the five quarters that are under consideration. Uh, it's important that we good, get good value for the public dollar that's spent. Uh, it's important that whatever we build, we can afford to operate uh, on an ongoing oper with our ongoing operational budget. And it's important that the infrastructure um, be affordable as well. Uh, I, I think our, our public insists on that. We owe that to them. And, uh, and I think we've got a good solution with in Enhanced Plus. So I'm here to encourage you to ad adopt the Enhanced Plus uh, solution and uh, wish you best of luck as you weigh your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Seth Sadowski, followed by Teresa Parker. 
Good evening, Mayor Venice, Councillors, and LTD Board members. My name is Seth Sadovsky. I live in Eugene in Ward 2, and I rely on the bus for my daily transportation needs. As we try to plan our transportation future for the city, we should keep our goals and our limitations in mind. Our transportation goals include reducing greenhouse gases, safety, equity, and convenience. Our current system meets those goals pretty well if you are an unusually confident bicyclist or if you're lucky enough to live in one of the most convenient parts of the city. Otherwise, most adults take most trips alone in two-ton combustible death machines. On average, six people are killed and 35 people suffer serious life-changing injuries due to car crashes in Eugene every year. The majority of these deaths and injuries occur on the same major transportation corridors we are discussing today. Therefore, it is imperative that we work seriously on safety improvements as part of any moving ahead implementation. In order to meet our city's goals, we need fewer and smaller cars, more and better bus service, safer and more comfortable places to walk and bike, and development patterns that put new businesses and residences near these facilities. As we look at the moving ahead planning documents, it seems that enhanced corridors will bring us nearly as close to all of these goals as full EMX for these corridors, at a fraction of the cost, both upfront and operating costs, and hopefully a fraction of the time frame that would be required for constructing full EMX lines. In addition to doing our best to build the enhanced corridors, we should make needed safety improvements that would be included in the full MX for all of these thoroughfares as efficiently as possible. We should accelerate the enhanced corridor work as much as possible and get appropriate safety improvements along with better sidewalks, crossings, lighting, and intersection priority for buses. We also need to get serious about encouraging transit-oriented development around these corridors as transit improves. This can be a difficult chicken and egg problem, but committing to a plan for the future can help spur development in the right places. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Teresa Parker, followed by Claire Rivode. Good evening. My name is Teresa Parker. I live at 18th and Jefferson in Ward 1. I retired from Lane Transit District in January of 2013 as their accessible services manager at the time. Thank you all for stepping up and committing yourself to doing the demanding work of listening. I've been to many of these sessions over the last year, and I really think you do a great job of paying attention, listening. And uh, I know that's not always easy. I only speak for myself. However, I'd like to acknowledge the work of BEST, League of Women Voters, and 350 Eugene to inform and dig deep on local transportation issues and opportunities. I have two points that I'd like to make. The first is the overriding urgency of climate change and the need to act in accordance with that reality. Our fo focus going forward should be to look through the lens of climate action and do everything within our power to reduce greenhouse gases and other polluting emissions. It really is time to come forward with an action plan, particularly within the transportation sector. That's why I'm really encouraged by the recent work of Lane Transit District has done to compile their first greenhouse gas inventory and to establish a board ad hoc committee on sustainability. Thank you, and we'll be right there with you. Enhanced Corridor Plus offers the quickest turnaround on our investment. A second lane on Franklin Boulevard should be considered for its potential to meet demand that we know is there. It'd be great for River Road residents to see their efforts continue into something tangible before a decade goes by. And Highway 99 needs safety features for those who have limited transportation choices. Thank you for working with the Friendly Area Neighborhood. Um, the intersection improvement at 19th and Jefferson was much needed and makes my life feel so much safer. And I also want to thank you um, because I think I had a, we had a conversation not too long ago about don't we do something right occasionally? Um, of course you do. And I love those things that on, in, when you come up to the bike light and you can kind of figure out where your bike needs to be so that a light will go on. I remember a dark winter night leaving LTD late on my bike. And you can get a card to get in the gate, 
but your car just passes out to trigger the gate to leave. I spent 15 minutes driving it around a circle trying to find the little thing on the ground that would kind of like open the gate. I'm sure you guys have fixed that by now. It's been a while. So I want to thank you, and again, thank you for listening. Thank you. Claire Rabode, followed by Jack Taylor. Hi, I'm Claire Rebo, and I live in Ward 1. And I volunteer with 350 Eugene in addition to living in this fine town. Um, the Regional Transportation Greenhouse Gas Reduction Plan requires more than doubling the 2015 transit ridership of 10 million by 2035. None of the proposed packages get anywhere close. We need more and more effective solutions. Sidewalks are the capillaries of this system. Right now they are frequently absent, or they are isolated, or they are impassable. For equity, for safety, for connection, we need to publicly fund sidewalk infill and maintenance. These are public roads for pedestrians. Dedicate a network of roads to pedestrians, bike, and bus only. Operate neighborhood commuter vans to and from bus stops. Install solar power collection and storage to support the electrification of transit and to build resilience. Whatever the specific strategies may be, every aspect of regional planning interacts with transit. Powerful transit and climate solutions will be designed, built, and funded using that synergy. All of these packages in concert will bring us to uh, success with our climate action plan. Thank you. Thank you. Jack Taylor, followed by Matt McRae. Mayor and councilors, board members and staffs, my name is Jack Taylor. I live at 13th and Olive in Eugene, that's Ward 1. And I went shopping on the MX today and I walked to this meeting. My priority for transportation expenditures over the next 10 years is to address the climate crisis by reducing greenhouse gas emissions while enhancing social equity. While I support LTD and city staffs to make technical decisions in looking at the list of criteria out in the lobby, I wonder where the greenhouse gas emissions and the climate crisis were because they weren't on that list. Why didn't they make the list of criteria for these five investment options? For me, the most important expenditures in this 10-year time frame are mostly around the Enhanced Corridor Plus package, but they are two generally. One is to increase the frequency and coverage of bus service and restriping travel lanes for safety. That means adding buses, drivers, and shelters more than greenhouse gas intensive heavy construction. The MX buses are heavy, they require concrete. Concrete is a heavy greenhouse gas uh, method. Of course, that also means heavier public outreach because like most of the people in this room, uh, we need to get people out of their cars, not just to increase ridership, but increase the ridership of people who would otherwise drive. The other expenditure would be replacing diesel buses with electric buses at every opportunity, both full-size buses and small ones like ride source uses. uses. In general, like Greta said, our house is on fire. Please act like it. Thank you. Matt McRae, followed by Karen Knutson. <coughs> Hello, LTD Board, City Council. My name is Matt McRae, I live in Ward 1, and I just wanna start by thanking you all for taking the time to uh, hear us. 
I would reiterate the last speaker's comments that we should be asking about and reporting the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the options that are before you. When I ride a bus across town, I use far less fuel than I, when I make the same trip by car. Transit is a powerful tool to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and you know this. It's the reason that Eugene's Climate Action Plan has several priority actions focused specifically on transit. Recent analysis suggests that emissions from passenger vehicles would be some 25% higher if we didn't have transit. 25% more emissions if we didn't have the transit that we have today. So uh, in the box of good decisions, we've made really great investments, but we need to continue to use that tool. In addition to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, tra transit improves air quality and dramatically reducing costs for healthcare. And better transit service serves to reduce some of the social inequities that are built into every single block of our current transportation system. All the great inv innovations that come with MX can decrease travel times and increase ridership and increased frequency in and of itself can decrease travel times and increase ridership. We need to do the smartest mix of both. Finally, there's no time to waste. The best available science says we need to be off of fossil fuels in 30 years if we want to avoid some really painful outcomes. Appropriately, this is the goal that Eugene City Council adopted for our community, near zero emissions by 2050. City councilors, this is one of the biggest tools in the transportation toolbox. We will have to invest boldly in our transportation system if we want to meet our climate, health, and safety goals. We need the best transit system we can afford, and we can't wait 10 years to make it to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Karin Knudsen, followed by Jim New. Good evening, Karin Knudsen, Ward 3, uh, architect and project lead with Better Housing Together. Hello, uh, council, mayor, LTT board, and city manager. Um, thank you, first, uh, collectively, for your service to this community. Um, I want to begin by just raising one statistic uh, that the people in this community that you're serving are, are very familiar with, and that is that more than 60% of the median household's income goes to the costs of housing and transportation alone. More than 60%, 60 cents of every dollar to housing and transportation costs alone. This is in part because we face a housing crisis and we need your continued action on that front, but also because we need to expand transportation options and give people more affordable transportation options and more safe, active transportation options to meet their daily needs. So expanding transportation options and improving service, uh, those are both meaningful ways rel related to your discussion tonight uh, that we can respond to this challenging statistic and help the community uh, and the people that are a part of this community. I think there's no question as you all deliberate and as you have conversations in the, in the community that frequent and reliable transit service is necessary, that we need to do the work to expand this system. And I hope that you will be really clear in your work to share that uh, with others and to advocate uh, and work towards those outcomes. We need frequent reliable service. That could be transit tomorrow plus enhanced corridors. Uh, and parts partially MX, what matters is the frequent reliable service. Um, and it matters that we're making improvements at the same time to all modes, giving people more options for how they move around safely in this community, showing them that we prioritize their safety and their needs. Uh, but the work doesn't stop there. It really doesn't stop with just thinking about the transportation corridor and our transportation network. We need to think about more than that as a time, at a time, and we need for you all to think about and support more than just that issue at one time. So in close, I'll, I'll simply say that I would, I guess, ask you to turn to the, the board member or the city councilor sitting next to you and ask that you each support each other's work in these coming months and years. City councilors, please do everything you can to help us to implement uh, a, a transportation system that is frequent, that is reliable, that is the envy of the world, and indeed serves the world when they come here to visit us. And LTD board members, please do everything you can to ensure and encourage that our con community continue to do the work to expand housing options and implement meaningful housing solutions and housing supply along our transportation corridors. 
frequency of transportation, transportation uh, transit service, uh, transportation options, and housing together is the complete picture that we're looking for in serving the community. So thank you for, for working towards those ends. Thank you. Jim New, followed by Carmen Four. Mayor, Council, and LTD Board, thank you for holding this public uh, hearing. Uh, my name is Jim New. I live in the Santa Clara area in um, Clara Surrett's ward. I regularly attended the Envision Eugene workshops for the River Road Santa Clara area. Public transit, transit and safe bike ped rights of way were overwhelmingly supported in public participant feedback. The Beltline Highway repeatedly came up as a barrier to current north-south tr transit travel between the two neighborhoods. Safe bike ped corridors and frequent public transit options would improve accessibility between the two neighborhoods. All of the proposed uh, MX packages should be considered by all of you. However, the City of Eugene Climate Action Plan has a sector-based greenhouse gas emission gap of 450,000 megatons of CO2. The City and LTD should prioritize adopting and implementing the highest level investment options for each corridor. Providing the highest level of bike ped safety and transit ridership would close this greenhouse gap in the most expeditious manner. The IPCC has stated we have 10 years to implement plans to reduce our global climate footprint, carbon footprint, I'm sorry. Your decisions are one means locally to achieve that goal. Cost should not be a factor if you consider what the cost would be if you were to try and do this 10 years from now. But then it may be too late to start and we are not afforded the luxury of time. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Carmen Four, followed by Barbara Perrin. Good evening. My name is Carmen Four, and I'm a mayor, councillor, as LTD board members, and I'm a resident of Ward 2, and I'm sorry to have lumped that um, a little all over the place there. I've really enjoyed the comments I've heard tonight and want to really associate myself with a lot of them, that really the importance of climate change is a paramount issue uh, before our community and before our world. Transit really has stood as a really important option and a tool in our tool chest to really reduce GHG reduction. I'm a frequent bus rider and it's uh, a really important service for me but what really is key in that service for me being a bus rider is the frequency of that ride and I think oftentimes we talk to our neighbors you know what, what is it that they need on the street if they need to get to the grocery store if they need to reliably get home to pick their kids up from school if they need to be able to get to a medical appointment on time or even if they're working late at night is that service available to them so they can get home safely at night and we do not some of our neighbors sleep in the workplace because there isn't a way for them to get home at the end of the day. When we're looking at transit ridership and all the health options, all the social equity, diversity, inclusion issues that we need to bear in mind, a lot of it is really how are folks living and how are we going to get them onto that, taking that transit trip a bit more frequently and how do people really live. We've been a community, and as I've traveled and talked to people in transportation sectors that look to this community as a model, and in both in terms of our early adoption of uh, uh, accessibility for people with disabilities in our communities, you know, on those transit trips, to having, being the smallest community in the country to adopt BRT, we've been a role model. Ultimately, I think we do need to be looking at options in the near term that provide the most accessible number of trips and start changing those patterns for those folks who have the ability to make that choice, but also for our neighbors in our community that don't have a choice or that find at times they're stuck in their home because the options to get around for them are just a bit challenging. What's great about the de debate we're having right now, it's not if we should be investing in transit at all, which is often the debate that's going on in most of the communities around our country. We're debating what type of transit we wanna have. And to that end, I think really what can serve the vast majority of people in the greater region, in addition to meeting these larger social objectives, are what we need to have forefront in our mind right now. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Barbara Perrin. Followed by Patty Hine. Hi, my name's Barbara Perrin, or Perrin, and I live in South Eugene. Uh, I've associated with 350 and also with BEST, and I think that members of both of, the, of those organizations have uh, laid out all the very, very definitely um, uh, important reasons why transit 
can help with the climate crisis. So I'm not going to uh, go over that, uh, except to say that I second all of the reasons that they've given. Um, but what I would like to say is that I'm very grateful um, to LTD. Um, I began riding the bus a few years ago because um, I needed to fit within a suddenly very reduced budget. And um, I found that it was um, a remarkable change in my lifestyle. Um, I walked many, many, many more uh, blocks and eventually miles than I ever had before. Um, and I also um, got the satisfaction of knowing that I was not driving a car, not participating in the, you know, the um, degradation of our climate. Um, and I was happy about doing that. So I would like to say that um, it's, it's very important, and I second Karen's, I guess she left, um, um, message about having the community build and have housing and transportation accessible. So many people drive because they have no option. They have no option to get to, I happen to live, for rent an apartment that's close to a bus stop. But if things change, if things be start to become, um, you know, much more centralized, I'm going to have to move. I'm going to have to find another place to live that's close to a bus because I'm a dedicated bus rider now. So I just want to put that out there as another way to look at what we're, what you are making decisions about. Um, and in closing, I'd like to say that um, one of the things that just recently occurred to me was riding a bus is kind of like a mobile commons. It brings the community together in a way that people going their own individual ways in their own individual cars never happens. And I think that's something to celebrate, too, about transit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Patty Hine, followed by our self. Uh, good evening, LTD uh, commissioners and city councilors. It's nice to see you. My name is Patty Hine, and I live in the county. I, I volunteer with 350 Eugene, a grassroots roots climate uh, justice organization that a few people here have referred to. And I really am grateful always for these public hearings. I've started to be at more of them than I ever thought I ever would be. And uh, I am, uh, I'm humbled by how much work gets done. And the public hearing part is an important part of our democracy, and I, I treasure that. Um, along the public uh, input idea, uh, the 350 Eugene group has been working with the city of Eugene on its climate action plan for some years now, and we've been doing a lot of work with them. And uh, about a year ago, we said, where is the, we, we want to have a little more community input. And we said, we are going to stick our necks out and have some town halls that have to do with climate and see what the community has the appetite for. What is it that they are most interested in? I think you'll be, uh, you'll, you'll like to know. And so last February, we had a town hall down at the Temple Beth Israel where 250 citizens showed up and we had some very good speakers who just laid it out for us. Tell us what it is that's most important to you that the city of Eugene would do and its partners to combat climate breakdown that has been so well described here and we know it's coming. And uh, three of the six highest priority items had to do with transportation. The first one was make walking and biking safer. The second one was increase ridership on transit. And from that, we held another town hall on transportation explicitly because it was obviously of such interest to the community. And then no less than six new subgroups have formed to do climate advocacy, specifically where electric vehicles are concerned, transit is concerned. Uh, Phil Barnhart talked about another club. It's not a 350 club, but nonetheless, you can see he's often running on a very interesting enterprise for a state-sponsored EV group. Um, there's also... Um, a walkers group. And so some of those people are now starting to appear in every public forum where I've been appearing. And so what you see here is grassroots organizing at its finest, direct from the public, coming forward to speak with our elected officials and our representatives. And I'm very proud to see a lot of those people here. I'm here because I wear this t-shirt everywhere. <laughs> it is my uniform and a lot of other people's uniform too. And it is because we are scared to death about what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from the UN has said. 
other people have spoken about it. It's our 11 or so years, 10 years. And I like to refer to what Naomi Klein says often when she's speaking. She says, there's some things that are broken in the world and they are big features of our earth. The coral reef, the Amazon is on fire. And what was the other one? The ice sheets are melting. And these are huge features of our earth and they're broken. Thanks for your boldest action. Thank you. Our self, followed by Julie Daniel. Thank you. I'm Richard Self with uh, Ward 1, I believe, but my heart is in uh, Ward 9 and will forever be. I am with How's Everyone, and I see you folks often enough that it's almost like being among friends. I am a homeless advocate, and so I'd like to address LTD in that regard. Uh, so I'm speaking as folks uh, for people that have no voice and often have no phone, so uh, may not be able to use your nifty new app. Um, so in that regard, I would like, I am here today to encourage LTD, as I understand for those folks who are not able to use the app, you're going to have swipe cards. And I'm here to encourage LTD to provide as many more day passes to those swipe cards to the service providers they provide to now. Uh, more so as possible, um, because one or two a month is grossly inadequate. A pregnant woman interviewed by the Homeless Outreach Committee of How's Everyone was needing to see her physician, had already used her one day pass for the month. A week later, she was interviewed by the same committee members of the Homeless Outreach and had miscarried. She had no other means of transportation. So I ask in my humble capacity that LTD provide more resources in conjunction with the city for the homeless, as in more day passes available in whatever form they may manifest, and to allow the unhoused access to ride LTD in whatever form the buses are, or corridors within reason for purposes of getting to and from meal sites, warming centers, day centers, shelters, physicians, housing appointments, jobs, etc. So no one goes hungry, misses a meal, an appointment or miscarries. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Julie Daniel, followed by Nick Dykus. Good evening, councillors, and good evening, LTD board. I'm Julie Daniel. I live in Alan Zelenka ward, Alan Zelenka's ward. And um, I'm a big fan of transit, and I uh, echo all the sentiments that have been said tonight about increasing the frequency. But I want to give you a bike rider's perspective. I use a bike for in-town travel. In fact, I rode here tonight, and there's not enough bike parking. It was all full by the time I got there. There's one thing you can fix. Um, and I support the enhanced um, corridor option for moving ahead with the addition of bike and pedestrian improvements that the MX op um, option offers. Councillors, you recently reviewed the Climate Action Plan 2.0 transportation strategies, and as was pointed out in Mayor Venice's blog, we need more people on bikes, more people on buses, and a lot fewer car trips. Now, bikes are like cars in one important respect. No planning is required. When you want to go somewhere, it's just dead easy. You get on your bike, you hop on, and you go. To use public transit, whether it's a bus or an MX, you do have to figure out the schedule, the route, how you get to the bus stop, if there's a bus stop near you, if there's a bus stop where you're going to go. It's a lot more work. People love their cars because they provide convenience, autonomy, and spontaneity, but so do bikes. 
And I find bike, bikes a cheaper, convenient, viable alternative to auto travel. But I tell you, it's proving very, very challenging to persuade my friends to join me. And so why is it so hard to get people out on their bikes? And I can tell you in one word, fear. Most people view sharing the streets with cars as inherently dangerous. Vision Zero emphasizes this point. Three of the arterials moving ahead evaluated, River Road, Coburg Road, and Highway 99, are identified in Vision Zero as high crash streets. Now that's a heartwarming thought. Crashes that disproportionately harm pedestrians and cyclists. Now I'm one of those confident, if aging and feeling more vulnerable, bike riders, and I've ridden year round for over a decade. And I ride in nearly every part of town, and I've ridden on all those arterials in the last month. And I tell you, it takes some nerve. Try riding through the Beltline River Road intersection for some white knuckle high adrenaline thrills. All that protects me from a ton of fast moving steel is this helmet, some flashing lights, and a reflective vest. It's, it doesn't feel very safe, let me tell you. I know lots of older people like me who would like to use a bike more often. And these are folks who really worry about climate change. When they go to Denmark, when they go, they ride their bikes. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nick Dykus, followed by Linda Perrine. Or Perrine. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nick Dykus. I live in Ward 4 I'm on Harlow Road. You've seen me with 350 and with the Sunrise Movement, but today I'm here representing myself and my wife. I bike to work nearly every day. I'm lucky for that to be a relatively quick and safe way to get to work. Uh, it's faster than taking the bus for me. My wife takes the bus every day. I also have the fortune of owning a plug-in hybrid, which we mostly use for shopping and long distance travel, one car. I would like to talk about supporting a middle way tonight. Uh, I'm not in the MX or bust group. I also think that no build is not an option. Uh, I think we need to make sure that uh, we're not running buses f super frequently to places where there isn't demand. Uh, but I also appreciate ideas like best recommendations for Enhanced Corridor Plus. I don't think Enhanced Corridor Plus is enough. I think we need to be talking about packages C and D, which is MX on River Road and MX on Coburg Road. I think this moment demands that we set, set our sights reasonably high here. This is a 10-year plan to my understanding. So we need to imagine what Eugene is going to look like in 10 years. Estimates are that population will grow about 40,000 people by 2035 and within the county about 67,000 people. There's going to be, we need trans, uh, densification around transit. We also need to be thinking about how traffic is going to get worse. If you've ever seen Ferry Street Bridge or Coburg Road at rush hour, you know it's already bad. Just imagine how much worse it's going to get. We need to start planning for that worse it's gonna get now. 10 years is also our time frame to become carbon neutral as a planet. So we're talking about adding River Road on, on um, MX on River Road. That's 213,000 additional riders each year. Add in Coburg Road, an additional 195,000. So that's the equivalent. If you add them together, 408,000 more rides, 16,660 football fields of cars off the road every year. And you can imagine the less pollution, the less noise, the less frustration and quality of life issues there. Um, research shows that people are happier when they get out of their cars. These buses need to be electric or hydrogen, okay? Um, and I believe that we're gonna find some federal funding because people in 10 years are going to be in the streets when they find that they can't live or breathe. Benefits of MX include a brand that people trust. It's cool, it's fast. You look out the window and you see it keep coming. So you're gonna try that, especially if your option is waiting in traffic. And we need the shelters, the seating, the next bus sign, all those things that when people come visit, they say, this is a place I could live. This place has its priorities straight. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Perrine. Followed by Meta Maxwell. Good evening, I'm Linda Perrine. I'm in unincorporated Eugene out on Highway 58. 
Uh, and I do want to echo everyone thanking you for holding this joint hearing. It's really, um, really nice to hear the positive comments out of the um, audience tonight, as well as just the encouragement to um, work on an integrated, all-encompassing solution for transport. Um, as you know, uh, you have a gap strategy to deal with for the Climate Action Plan, and uh, I want to echo Matt McRae's comments about how the LTD options should really have greenhouse gas analysis numbers to go with it, so I would encourage the council to ask LTD to produce that. I also want to echo Phil Barnhart's comments about needing an integrated solution. Um, my front row view on Highway 58 tells me there's a whole lot more commute traffic going on on that major artery in and out of Eugene every day of the week than there has been in the past 10 years. So while I know this city council only is here to address the internal city solution for transport, you have a lot of people coming in on Highway 126, both east and west side, as well as 58 in and out of the city that's not being addressed by this plan. Um, the other thing is LTD options that are out in the lobby uh, leave me wondering about where all these people that come in on a corridor are going, what is their solution once they're in town? So um, biking, walking, those solutions, we really need an integrated answer to, trans to the solution that LTD is putting forward and how does that end up uh, affecting walking and biking and parking bikes and making those transfers. Um, <clears throat> I want to also encourage, I, Sarah Mays got up and spoke earlier, and she has an excellent presentation from her trip to Copenhagen. 4J granted her some money to go over there and learn how biking affects the uh, Copenhagen culture. And she gave this at the River Road uh, Neighborhood Association meeting last Monday, and it's a really excellent talk that I encourage the city staff as well as the council to ask her to, to show it to you. Um, it shows how Copenhagen make, made a transition in 25 years from a car-centric culture to a bike transit-centric culture. And you can't solve just one problem with transit only, it's a bike and transit solution. So we really need to have both sides of that equation to be voted on by the public. Um, also, you heard Chelsea Clinton give you the CAP uh, review again this past week, and <clears throat> You all talked about scooters in that discussion, in your council discussion, more than you did bikes and walking. So it's clear to me the council is, as a body, overlooking the value of biking and using biking as a solution. Um, I know scooters are a fad. They're all over up and down California. They might have a niche role to play. They do not have the role to play that bikes do. Thank you. Thank you. Meta Maxwell. Followed by Claire Roth. Hello, my name is Meta Maxwell. I'm a resident of North Eugene. My family settled here in 1852, and I was born here. Um, I'm an avid walker of 20 to 30 miles a week. I use the bike paths. I've ridden the MX system, especially to the U of O, where parking is difficult. I have a bachelor's degree in business administration and a master's in agriculture and resource economics and have taught university courses in accounting and finance. I own commercial property on Coburg Road and on West 6th. Last spring, I was invited to a transportation open house at the Safeway on Coburg Road and was told I'd receive a follow-up call to meet with the planners at my property on Coburg Road to, re to review the moving ahead plans, but the call never came. Last week, I was sent notice of this meeting with attachments of over 200 pages, which I've only had a time to scan. But my initial review leaves me with five major concerns I'd like to see addressed in the plan um, and have time to review before final consideration is given. First, well, um, the moving ahead plan gives consideration to an increase in the population in the area of over 34,000 in 10 years. No consideration seems to be given to an aging of the population. The median age of 34 is skewed by a part-time college and university population. While my understanding is that retirees account for a large part of the growth, 
The population, I believe, is largely less healthy, out of shape, and less likely to bike or walk and would have difficulty getting to bus stations and using the system for doctors shopping and entertainment. Secondly, I see no projections for an increase in single vehicle transportation, which I'd expect to accompany an increase in this population, despite people's desire for fewer cars. Third, no consideration is given to climate change. With hotter summers and colder winters, again, it becomes more difficult to get to and from the bus stations and less favorable for biking or walking. Um, I see the dedicated MX lanes largely unused while adjacent lanes are crowded with cars. So maybe um, making those partly carpool lanes and allowing all electric vehicles would be one, some good options to help lower the uh, uh, transportation blocks. Number four, um, I haven't seen specific plans. I'll follow up with the letter. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Claire Roth, followed by Bob Pissarro. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Council, and LTD Board. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Claire Roth. I work with Better Eugene Springfield Transportation, uh, aka BEST, as Safe Streets Coordinator. I live in the Whitaker District in Ward 7. Um, I want to highlight the importance of the complete streets logic outlined under the handful of safety plans that our city is pursuing, such as the Vision Zero Action Plan adopted back in March. While choosing the best option, which we at best are referring to as the Enhanced Corridor Plus, and as you've heard about tonight from some of my peers, we must not forget to prioritize pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure projects as well. A city with complete streets, where all modes of transportation and people of all abilities and ages can navigate safely is a successful and proper, prosperous one. Eugene has all of the tools and more, and all of the clever minds to make this happen. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bob Passaro, followed by Tiffany Edwards. Hello, thank you all for being here and for working together on this. Obviously, needs both organizations. Um, my name is Bob Passaro. I live in Ward 1. Um, I'm currently on the BEST Board of Directors. Um, in the past, I've served on the city's Active Transportation Committee, known at the time as BPAC. Um, and I'm co-owner of a business with an office just a few blocks from here. Um, so I moved to Eugene 22 years ago to uh, take a job at the Register Guard and uh, ended up buying a house at 17th and Lawrence um, and being the kind of person that used a bike to get around ever since I was a kid, I found myself spending a lot of time in the bike lane on Coburg Road, um, commuting the five miles to work. Uh, sometimes I drove, I'm not a fanatic. Um, on occasion I took the bus and uh, I'm thankful there's a bike lane on Coburg Road, and I'm thankful the bus was available. Um, but I, you know, it, it's obvious the bike lane on Coburg Road is not for everyone, uh, as Julia pointed out. Um, and uh, riding the bus to work took me uh, twice as long as to drive and, and, f and longer than it would take to ride my bike to work. Um, so I mention all this because I think it's important as you come to the end of this uh, moving ahead planning process that um, to think about the value of providing better options for various modes of trans transportation, various modes of travel on all these important arteries in town, um, in addition to just transit. Better, safer, more efficient, practical options. I'm sure that's easy. Um, so not all trips are the same. Not all modes of, of travel are appropriate for every trip. So um, I think that's what this needs to be about. And as we think about addressing the inevitable congestion brought on by growth of our community, as we think about uh, trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, as, as the city has committed to do, um, and as we think about reducing death and injury on the roads, as the city has also committed to do, um, we may want to consider that one single tool is not the answer. Maybe it's not one big thing, like a large investment in MX on all these five corridors. Um, maybe there's a way to find a more creative mix appropriate to each street that includes frequent bus service 
uh, safer, more comfortable bike facilities. Uh, I think the advent of electric bicycles is is going to change the role of bicycles and make them more practical for many more people. Um, the removal of obstacles to walking easily and safely when you don't have far to go. Availability of bike share, this adorable, intriguing little MGO thing I keep seeing around. Maybe all these are pieces of the puzzle and, and the ongoing improvement of all these pieces. So thank you very much. Thank you. Tiffany Edwards, followed by David Davini. Mayor Venice, City Councilors, LTD Board Members. I'm Tiffany Edwards of Ward 5, and I'm here tonight to provide testimony on behalf of the Eugene Area Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber recognizes the thorough and ongoing process in which the City and LTD have been working to engage the community. Our local Government Affairs Council had six meetings on the topic over a one-year period, and we have some specific recommendations to incorporate as you move through the process. Generally, our members support investments for enhanced corridors to ensure more complete streets and improvements to bike, pedestrian, transit, and vehicular infrastructure. However, the business community felt that there was further study needed to be able to determine if investments in MX and on which specific corridors made sense. So while we're not saying no altogether to MX, we haven't seen the evidence at this time that investments would be sound. Our members would like to see specifically how the Moving Ahead project intersects with all of the other planning processes currently underway. Transit Tomorrow, Envision Eugene, River Road, Santa Clara Neighborhood Planning, Housing Tools and Strategies, Implementation of House Bill 2001, Code Changes that may make sense as we grapple with our housing crisis, and so on. Even projects like Beltline would change the way people move around our community. But how would those changes impact where we'd consider MX? We know that a robust transit system and multimodal infrastructure are an asset to the community, but nobody has done the research to determine what the broader economic impacts would be of making these investments. Cost is a big factor for the businesses, and we have a lot of competing community needs. Chamber members will want to know that these are the best ways we can invest and not be beholden to ongoing operations for a system simply because we sought federal funds. Enhanced corridors provide flexibility, but also allow us to plan for future improvements. The Chamber supports enhanced corridors and prioritizing MX as part of the Franklin Boulevard transformation project. We support completing transit tomorrow, and would like to see stabilization of transit funding sources and continued land use changes to support desired transit-oriented development in line with Envision Eugene. The Chamber is truly committed and continuing to engage in this community planning process and are prepared to support what we can through data, due diligence, and further study. Thank you. Thank you. David Devini, followed by Peter Bolander. Uh, Mayor, City Councilors, LTD Board Members, my name is David Davini and I'm a resident of Lane County. I want to thank you for taking the time to hear from the community on the Moving Ahead Alternatives Analysis. My, invol my involvement with Moving Ahead began back in 2015 when we hired CSA to do a performance review on the Gateway MX segment. That review indicated a significant underperformance compared to projected ridership. Based on that information, I was very concerned when I saw the community contemplating as many as five additional MX routes. I am a supporter of public transportation, especially for the members of our community with no viable alternative. However, I cannot support inefficient use of transportation dollars that will result in very few, if any, additional riders and will leave our community with expensive and inflexible infrastructure. Over the years, I have learned that the best time to get involved with public projects is at the planning phase. Once excavators arrive on site, it is too late to have any meaningful impact. That is why I'm here tonight. In September of 2018, the City and LTD published a 30-page executive summary in order to help the community better understand what the over 350-page moving ahead analysis meant. I read it thoroughly. After a second thorough read, I was still confused, so I hired CSA to interpret the analysis and explain to me what it means. CSA responded with a 12-page review summarizing what the Moving Ahead document said. It was provided to the City and LTD earlier this year. I encourage each of you to review that report. 
My primary concern with the moving ahead project is the projections being used to justify the new segments. Although LTD ridership has decreased almost 30% over the past decade, moving ahead projects an annual increase of 1.5% each and every year for the next 20 years. If that increase were only 1.2%, the all MX alternative would use approximately $331 million of local dollars and would produce no additional riders. Given that two of the three current MX segments are significantly underperforming their initial ridership projections, it is reasonable to assume the moving ahead projections are aggressive at best. I have heard concern tonight regarding greenhouse gas emissions. I share those concerns. Unfortunately, according to the moving ahead's internal analysis, the all MX package actually increases GH gas greenhouse gas emissions. Please understand the numbers. Adding infrastructure to a transportation system that does not reduce greenhouse gas emissions in our current global warming environment is socially irresponsible. I urge each of you to take the time to really understand what moving ahead is about and understand both the economic as well as the operational implications to our community. Once the system is, is in place, it is very expensive to change or alter should the community wish to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Bolander, followed by Wade Woodcock. Good evening, my name is Peter Bolander. I live in the Santa Clara area. Um, I took the bus here today, it took me 40 minutes. If the River Road Enhanced Corridor is built, it would take me 35 minutes to get from my front door to here. If the EMX alternative was built, it would take, again, 40 minutes. Now you ask yourself, EMX is supposed to be quicker. Well, I live about a mile and a quarter from, river, or from the Beltline, and I'd have to walk an additional distance to get to the end of the EMX line. The EMX line ends partway up River Road into the Santa Clara area. My concern with that is that it's not really serving the people in the Santa Clara area uh, because the EMX line ends before it really gets into the Santa Clara area. Now I've noticed that there is a change to the uh, bus proposals, that bus is 51, 52, and 55 will be modified. I don't know how that will be modified, but what's interesting is they say they will, in the report there will be a 30 minute uh, frequency of the bus services. Well, if you look at the existing bus services between 51 and 52, it's anywhere between nine and 21 minutes. So a 30 minute delay is even long, or frequency is even longer than the current bus service. So again, I ask myself, is it really serving the people in the Santa Clara area? If the purpose and objective is to decrease travel time and increase the ridership, why not consider an express service, bus service from Santa Clara into downtown with maybe intermediate stops uh, along the corridor at uh, F F Myron, excuse me, not Myron Frank, Fred Meyer uh, or Silver Lane. My last comment deals with the cost. On the report, the alternative analysis report on page 5-15 addresses the cost for the river road in terms of construction, a dollars per construction mile or dollars per quarter mile. What I think would be more appropriate to address is dollars per increase in ridership. If using the Information on table 521, it gives the expected increased ridership in 2035. So using those numbers and assuming a 30 year period and in only the initial construction cost, the river road enhancement corridor alternative would increase, would cost each new rider $20 per trip over that 30 year period. Using the EMX river road alternative, it would cost $9 for each new rider over that 30 year period. Those happen to be the second in ninth all cost, excuse me, the sixth and second highest cost of all nine alternatives. I would estimate that for that $24 million to construct the enhanced corridor, you could double the amount of buses on River Road, provide express bus services, and increase ridership close to the EMX projected ridership. Maybe something to consider. But what I would suggest is, and it may be too late in this process, is maybe consider new pa package. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Wade Woodcock, is Wade still here? Doesn't look like it. George Rohde. George, and after George is Jay Harland. What's the timer? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, and thank you for all of your hard work. Uh, 
I own, by the way, I own the three oldest buildings on Franklin Boulevard in Eugene. I love MX. I think mass transit is really, really wonderful. I get concerned when they add another bus lane to it to take any of my sacred eight parking spots away from two of my properties. And that's really, really important. Uh, as of being green, I'm proud to say my businesses have won more awards in Eugene than any other companies, I think times two. Uh, I am very, very green. And there's something no one has considered in this. I look at 11th Street, used to be three lane, now it's two lane. There is so much slow traffic on 11th. And by the way, I took Climate Masters from business, from Sarah here, I think she's still here, was taught to grab the low fruit. You wanna lower the CO, the emissions in this area, make traffic flow quicker. St stop, stop and go traffic. Stop when you, it takes me three or four traffic lights to go down 11th during crowded times. We lost a lane in there. Sixth Street Corridor, the city traffic engineers have not coordinated Garfield Street with all the other streets. Get the low fruit first. Reset our traffic lights. Open it for traffic flow better is one of the solutions to lower emissions. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker is Jay Harland. Good evening, councilors and board members. My name is Jay Harlan with CSA Planning. I'm here this evening. Uh, our firm has been studying the Moving Ahead project uh, for a year, the document that was published. Our review has been based upon analysis in the supporting documentation. We've not done any of our own independent modeling or, or any specific analysis. Put another way, we've just accepted the details that have been done by the uh, professionals that LTD hired uh, for the project. Based on our review, moving ahead process uh, puts the LTD board and the city council, I think, in a pretty difficult position, especially for the all EMX alternative. Uh, selecting the all EMX alternative would effectively program $331 million of local tr transportation funds to bus rapid transit between the additional operating obligations and the capital investment over the next 20 years. The alternatives analysis should make it pretty straightforward for you all to understand the choices between the different alternatives and which ones uh, might make sense to, uh, to do. I think ultimately that's really not the case. In our opinion, the alternatives analysis is pretty difficult to understand and it's incomplete in several critical respects. One is, as David mentioned, the, the ridership trends currently are negative. The MX, uh, or the, the no-build assumptions in the analysis assume that the ridership is going to turn around and start going up at 1.5% a, a year every year for the next 20 years. It's fine to do projections like that and say, hey, we think this is going to turn around, but there should be some explanation of what's going on, what's changing. Well, for example, one of the things that's changed here in Eugene is, since I've come up here for Ducks games, there's a lot more student housing near the university, it seems like. Well, if you put housing near where people go, then they don't actually have to get on the bus. They can just walk or bike, as has been advocated by a lot of people tonight. That's what happens when you get the right mix of land uses near one another. So that's, I think there's no explanation in there about that, and that leads into investment risk, which has been spoken about a little bit tonight. Uh, if the ridership projections don't turn out to be correct, the, the cost per ride can be exactly what I think it was Mr. Bolander said that we we came up with similar numbers, nine and $20 a ride. That's pretty expensive. <clears throat> Some other details that aren't, I don't think, presented in a way that are easy to understand. One would be congestion on Coburg Road. Uh, there's, it's pretty hard to re look at the document and understand that there's going to be a pretty significant increase in congestion there. And there's some pretty significant adverse impacts to some of the uh, intersections. <clears throat> Finally, you've heard a lot of testimony tonight about the GHG emissions. And uh, one of the ladies even commented that that should be analyzed. Well, it is analyzed. It's literally buried in an appendix. I think it's like K or something. I can't remember off the top of my head tonight. But uh, the reality is that all the investment packages that include the EMX cause the GHG emissions to go up. 
Thank you. Thank you. And that ends the public testimony. There is an opportunity if council or LTD board members have comments or need for clarification. Does anyone, any councilors need to make a comment? Okay. Any directors? <clears throat> okay. Seeing none. All right. Well, we'll close the city council public hearing. And I close the LED public hearing. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. You made it. <laughs> I can push our water. <laughs> <laughs> didn't even have to do that. It all worked out. The candy's nice though, right? At a certain point, you go wall. You're just like, I need this. Like, I'm so <laughs> Look at that sound in the back. Right. Your mouth is dry. You haven't drank my water yet. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks much. for introducing Thanks. yourself. Thank you. Here, take them. Okay, well, that was. Yeah. yeah. I just turned around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well done. Well done. It's simple. Oh, a lot of times. Taking us through all the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. That was all very, you came very well prepared. Yeah. Nine, nine o'clock. Yeah. Better than my thought. Yeah. 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 Just a few more. I thought we might get 40 today. Yeah. It always happen. Well, it's, it's, it's that was a nice. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah